down to Southern California from Fresno, there was this, there's this one town, and I always forget the name of that town. But whereas, you know, usually they have bridges that go up over, you know, and you go under them. This town, they have two where they dug out, you know, and the, the bridge goes over, but you go down and under. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, move your headrest up. And I'm like, where did that come from? On that first time I was going under the bridge, where did that come from? Move my headrest up. What's going on here? But I got to the second where it goes under, down and under. And I felt that strong impression again, put your headrest up. And I went out and I raised it up and I thought, well, that's, that's something I can do. Well, might as well. If I had not raised that headrest, my neck would have been broken in that accident. And I gave my own self a black eye where I grabbed the steering wheel because my head went down and I punched myself. The glasses that I had on my face, I found later, had been folded up like someone said, you're going to need these later, and they were in the floor of the vehicle. An extra pair of glasses I had in my briefcase, I've always loved a briefcase even since third grade, yes. <laughs> Go ahead and make fun. Others have. (laughs) In my briefcase, locked briefcase, there were were a pair of glasses that were broken right down the middle as if they had been the ones on my head. With my good friend and co-worker, Steve Cole, in Miraflores, Peru. Steve was the best translator to go on a mission trip with. He had lived and studied uh, Spanish in Mexico. We were in uh, going to Peru on this mission trip, and he had one request. As a scuba diver, he said, I would like to put my foot in the ocean below the equator. I'm like, man, wow. All of that? You want to do all of that? What an easy request. So we or in Miraflores, outside of Lima, it's built on these cliffs. And Steve was left-handed, so he wore his watch on his right hand. We were in a cab, and he, ha- he was riding with the window down like this. And the cab driver said, you want to lose that arm? He's like, why would I lose my arm? He said, somebody's going to try to steal that watch if you keep hanging it out the window. So we got the impression then Miraflores wasn't one of the world's safest places to be, maybe. So we, we go down from the city, we have to go down, and there's a, a five-lane highway on each side, so I guess ten-lane highway, and there's a footbridge over that highway. And Steve, if you knew him, you know he always bought the best. And if you know me, you know I don't always buy the best. I like to seek out a bargain. So Steve had a, an expensive, nice, camera in a case. I had bought a camera at the Orange County Swap Meet in California for 10 bucks. It had to film and everything I needed, and I'm like, cool. And then asked Steve, Can, would you carry that in your nice case for me? So we're going down. Uh, we put our feet in the ocean, which we immediately regretted because our feet had an odor they have not had, had not had before that nor had after that. It was obviously not the cleanest place to put your feet. But we're coming back over the footbridge, going to go back to the city, and three, well, I I won't call them gentlemen because they weren't. Three guys came down, and the first guy, he hit Steve with, with his open palm, he hit Steve in the chest. He said, hey, buddy, and he grabbed the, the strap of the camera case. And they struggled, the strap broke, and Steve ran down the stairs, and this guy and another guy followed him. And, you know, at that moment I had ought against Steve. We, we worked it out later. But he was a runner. And, polar alert, I'm not. <laughs> I was built for comfort, not for speed. So there was one guy left, and in his sweatpants, he had a pistol right here. And 
I thought at that moment, even though I'm not the brightest person you know, I need to flee also. And I started up the stairs, past this guy. And I don't know if you ever had that dream where you're running and not going anywhere. You feel like your feet are in that miry clay. And you're like huffing and puffing in your sleep. You're exhausted and you're sleeping. That's why I felt. And so I go up a flight or two of stairs and there's a, a landing. It's probably not much higher than, than this stage was. And I was able to navigate that, which I was kind of proud, you know, in my condition, huffing and puffing. I got a, and I was running toward this major highway because I thought somebody needs to see me die. Judy and I had not been able to have children, but at this time, Judy was pregnant. I didn't know it, but uh, Tammy was pregnant. Uh, Steve told some lady, some Peruvian lady in a market in Spanish, but he didn't tell me. Thanks, Steve. He was buying an outfit, uh, and he said it was for one of his nieces or nephews. He later repented. It was for Matthew. And I thought, you know, when you're in a crisis, your mind sometimes just goes to the worst place. And I thought, I'm going to be shot, murdered in Miraflores, Peru, and not get to see my child. Or worse yet, I'm going to be shot in the spine and be paralyzed and try to get back to America somehow. And I felt the Holy Spirit. And I remembered at a church near my home church, there was a pastoral couple. They had gone to a general assembly, uh, a church convention in Kansas City, and they were mugged. And Sister Baynard, she began to pray in the spirit. And the thieves ran away. And I began to think, after my mind had gone to the worst place, I began to think, oh, this is going to be good after all. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. I thought, I saw, envisioned myself turning around and preaching a wonderful sermon to this man who was running after me, chasing me with a pistola. And I turned and I faced him and only one word came out and there was no more Holy Spirit feeling. And I went, I turned around, and I went, hola! I know I didn't. That didn't sound right. I said, alto, which I found out meant stop. And I don't know what happened, but his eyes got so big. I don't know if he just thought, well, this guy just lost his mind. He's crazy, which is a possibility. Or... If he saw something behind me, I don't know what happened, but he stopped pursuing me and he left. And I went back through the footbridge and I found Steve talking to a tourist policeman. Nobody, nobody was surprised that we were mugged. They were only surprised that there was a pistol involved instead of a knife. That was the only thing that interested people. Oh, a pistola, a pistola. Oh, a pistola. But I know that God spared my life on both of those occasions. And I know that some of you have similar stories. So when Jonah says that he brought his life out of a pit, not only has God brought my life out of the pit of sin, but God has time and time again spared my life and healed my sickness and blessed me and made a way where there didn't seem to be a way and lifted my head and been my provider. He is my everything. Yes. And no one at any time can convince me otherwise. He has saved me and healed me and helped me, made a way where there was no way. Jonah said he would sacrifice to God. With thanksgiving, he would pay what he vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And that's wonderful. It's a beautiful song. And in verse 10, it talks about the fish 
And since I'm going to be diplomatic because of the hour, regurgitated Jonah onto the shore. And we see in Jonah 3, 1, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Thank God it's not a one and done. You mess up the first time, you're out. But God is a gracious, merciful, loving God. But here's the, one of the things that bothers me about Jonah. God spares him. After his little trip of disobedience ends in the ocean, God spares him, spares his life, brings him to a point of doing the rest of his mission, fulfilling his calling. And Jonah has said, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice to you I'm going to, with thanksgiving. I'm going to do what I vowed to do, what I'm supposed to do. Salvation is of you, Lord. So then you get into chapter 4 of Jonah. And he's not a great preacher, obviously. He, he goes into this city of 120,000 people. It says it takes three days to walk through. At the end of the first day, he's like, 40, in 40 day, within 40 days, you're, this city is going to be overthrown. That didn't take a lot of study, a lot of preparation. And then he gets mad because he was successful. Because the people from the lowest to the highest, highest to the lowest, the king and everybody repented. And Jonah pouts. He's mad because people responded to his message. I don't have that problem. I have the opposite problem. But I see that Jonah then leaves Nineveh, goes out and builds a little shelter and waits to see what will happen. We know what's going to happen, Jonah. It's going to be spared because God said if they didn't repent, he would destroy it. They repented. Spoiler alert, Jonah. We know how this story is going to end. And he gets mad. Not grieved in his spirit. He's mad. He's angry. And then God prepares this vine with gourds and gives him shade, and he's happy again. An emotional roller coaster. God prepares a worm to destroy the vine, and he's angry again. Severe mood sweep for Jonah. And God asks him, do you have the right to be angry? Do you have a right to be angry because you're worried about a vine that came up in the night and was destroyed in the night? but a city of 120,000 souls you don't care about? And here's the thing that gets me about Jonah is this wonderful psalm of thanksgiving, has he forgotten about that? Has he forgotten about how God just delivered him? How could he do that? The same way we do. The same way we forget how God has time and time and time again helped us, answered our prayers, healed us, delivered us, made a way where there doesn't seem to be a way provided for us. We have short-term memory loss sometimes, especially when we have another thing we want God to do. So today, I'm going to leave you with these action steps. Well, I thought it was. Just lost my connection. In every situation, in every situation, call on God. Good times, bad times, in between times, call on God. Thank him for his mercy and grace that he has already given to you. Thank him for delivering you. Thank him for using you to minister to others. Thank him. You know, it's great when God partners with us. He doesn't need us (laughs) to carry out his will. But he partners with us, works through us. We get to be part of the solution when we minister to someone else. So I'm going to pray. And 
I realize that some of you have some very dire needs today, but before you ask God to meet those, would you just spend some time after I pray thanking him for what he's already done? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here. We thank you, Lord, that with all these different life stories represented in this room and online, God, we realize that you have brought us through some things, some dangerous things, some life-threatening things, some painful things. But God, I pray today that first, before we ask you for anything, that we would remember, bring back to our remembrance by your Holy Spirit things that we should be thankful for, things that we need to give thanks to you for. We don't want to be the ungrateful people who receive a gift and never say thank you. Lord, as, the, as we sang earlier, you have been good to us, you have been faithful to us, and we want to give you thanks. We were weak, but you made us strong. We're poor, and now we're rich in you. God, I, we just want to give you thanks. God, maybe just give us a peek of where we would be today without you so that we can never forget to thank you for all that you've done for us. Now, there may be some watching, maybe some here in this room that still need you to do something today. But before we ask you for anything, we're just going to thank you. We're going to show our gratitude because we realize we wouldn't be where we are without you. We owe it all to you. So God, we just come asking today that you would receive our gratitude, receive our thanks, that we, Lord, would enter your gates with thanksgiving today. And God, then, Lord, after we have thanked you, any needs that are in this room or for those watching online, I pray that you would move in a mighty way, that you would heal, that you would deliver, that you would help, that you would provide, that you would set free, that you would make a way where there is no way. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Would you just spend some time thanking him, remembering those times that God has come through when no one else would?